So um, our mission statement as a church is that Providence is a community on a mission to reach the city with the gospel while allowing it to renovate our lives. So we're about community, mission, and renovation. And we're really going to hammer those three things today. We're going to camp out on that. Community, mission, and renovation. Because we believe that's what brings glory to God as we really prioritize according to His Word, according to His will. So we're going to look at that. I'm going to bring the first section on community. Eddie's going to bring the, the next few, and then I'm just going to do a quick recap. And so if you'll turn with me, if you've got the scriptures in front of you, and if not, just listen along. Philippians 1, verse 27 and 28, because we want to deal with this idea of community and why this is important and why this is a way that we evaluate how we're doing as a church. Philippians 1, 27 and 28, it says, Only conduct yourself, yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you, or remain absent. I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponent, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Our community is really about unity. It's, it's about us gathering around the idea of the gospel. And what God has designed his people to do is in that community to be standing side by side, receiving comfort, encouragement, protection, and, uh, and, and many other things that come along in God's design with us being unified around the gospel. Um, unity or community is really sharing life together, just living life together. We're to be unified in all those things that are, that are truly important, our beliefs, our resources, our needs, our goals, all of these things we share together. And it's been cool, as we're going to see in a minute, some of the ways that God has been allowing you all to share life together, helping one another, supporting one another, encouraging one another, challenging one another. But in biblical terms, being in a community or a fellowship is not, hey, I went to church, and I get to check it off my box. I went to church this week, and then I go my way. Biblical community, or being in the body of Christ, is very intentionally living together with the common goal of exalting Jesus. Just proclaiming His excellence. Just going, He's great, He's amazing, He's great. And, 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 and our fellowship, and our coming together, and our unifying, is one of the telltale signs that we are authentic believers. And not simply in word only, but indeed in the truth. We are proclaiming this, living it. And the gospel is to be lived, not independent, as our day would have it, where people turn on the TV, I went to church, turn it off, I'm done. There's no sense in the Bible that you get that that's what God is saying about church. Church is people living life together with a common goal, common beliefs, common shared needs, meeting those needs, caring for one another, encouraging one another, admonishing one another, living life together. And unity re removes... Fear, it emboldens us, it brings us confidence and courage. It says, only conduct yourself in, in a manner worthy of the gospel, right? So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed. A lot of people are not real confident in their faith. They're not real confident when they go, not even in their homes, when they're in prayer or whatever, are, but especially when they go out and about, they're not very confident. They're quite fearful. They are very timid with their faith. And yet what he's saying is community, when we come in unity in the body of Christ, there's a fearlessness, gutsy type of Christianity that comes out of true community, a true unity around the gospel. And that unity and that gutsiness results in, he says, in no way alarmed by your opponents, meaning that you will be opposed, that this fiery ordeal that comes upon you is, is, shouldn't take us off guard and say, well, what's, oh, what's all this? I thought I lived for Christ. Everything is going to go well. No. You're going to be well, and you're going to know that you're well when you're serving Christ. But that isn't to say all the circumstances of your life will go well, and it's certainly not to say that people won't oppose you. He says, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them. This is crazy, but if you look at this, he's saying, how will they know they're going to hell? How will they know that this destruction is coming? This is a sign of it. Your gutsy, bold, unified faith that's coming out of the community of believers, where you come together, you get re-energized, you get invigorated, you get bold. Instead of always fearful and going, am I, am I saved or not saved? Or, 
uh, you know, should I speak up, should I not speak up? Oh, I can't say anything. It gets you gutsy. That's what the body, that's what the community of believers does. That you support one another, you help one another. Well, it's such an encouragement to me, and I know it is to you as well, who when I get together with the men and we get together and we talk and we find out, man, I took a beating for the gospel over there and wow, oh, look at this. And when it, whether it's serving or sharing or giving or whatever it is, when I hear other people's faithfulness in the body of Christ, I go, yes and amen. Man, I could I could give like that. I can experience, I can share like that. And it just emboldens you. It says, man, it's about Jesus. It's only about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. And it's about Jesus crucified and rising from the dead to cover my sin and my guilt and my shame and also set me free from my greatest enemy, sin, death, Satan, and demons. And I'm free and I can get gutsy. I can live gutsy. And a lot of people don't have a very gutsy walk with God because they don't have a real connection in the community of believers that's vibrant and healthy and it's going, hey man, we're about Jesus and let's keep that common goal and that common vision. In fact, in the community, we have a, in the back a key issues book, but because a lot of times community and that unity that, that, that builds community gets distorted and instead of unity, people end up in uniformity. And uniformity is not unity. Uniformity has nothing to do with grace. Uniformity has everything to do with laws and legalism. And that's not the type of community we want to have. What the Bible looks at in community is unity around the gospel of grace. And so what happens is people are like, I'm into tattoos. Right, Jerry? I'm not into tattoos. I drink beer. I don't drink beer. I, I homeschool. I would go to public school. Okay. So th those are all, you, you follow your conscience on them. But what happens is, people take those issues of conscience and start going, these are biblical absolutes. Of course, when they go to the Old Testament, right? They don't talk about the fact that in the Old Testament, you couldn't even have blended clothing, right? You know, as far as mine's polyester and wool or, you know, that'd be terrible. But, you know, something like that. Anyway, there are a lot of weird things, and they pick and pull whatever they want out of the Old Testament, they create rules, and they set their community, which is really all about uniformity rather than unity. We want to be, as Philippians says, about unity around the gospel. All that really matters is that you love Jesus and you believe and you walk by faith. That's all that matters. And then as you live out your faith, those areas of conscience are totally cool. You can take a lot different stance than I do, and you can have the... You, 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 all that really matters is that you vibrantly love with Jesus. And that you understand he's your only hope. You didn't do anything. You won't do anything. You're not a good person. I'm not a good person. But I'm a saved person. And I got saved, and now I get to be a part of the body of Christ. And I get to get gutsy, and I get to get bold by, by drawing into that. But I think that um, the... Example in Acts, if you want to turn there, or you can just listen along, however you want to do it. Acts 2.42, watching my time close, because I want to give, uh, get, get, get this thing, uh, make sure that we stay within the confines here. Acts 2.42, and this is the early church, and there was this beautiful unity in the early church. And he says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now that's a picture of unity. That's a picture of true community. And what's going on there, a lot of times we go, we look at that and we go, oh, that's great. But we live in America. It's all individualistic society, right? We all out for ourselves. And there's no way you could bring us people together to really be unified around something. Because as soon as someone gets picked off, what do they do? They just go down the street. But what we need to do is say, wait a minute. When you look at this Bible, you find that God did some amazing things. You start reading through there, you go, wow. God sent fire down and, and rain down fire. He opens up the ground and swallows up his enemies. He's got angels meeting with men. He's got he's got people who are basic, basically God makes them fireproof. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so that they are not consumed by the fire. And you've got all these supernatural things. And then we we show up today and we go, wait a minute. As though God were not in that business anymore, or that we can't expect that from Him anymore. But the reality is, I think we need to get a lot bigger view of what God. Can do. You know one of the supernatural things he does 
that he brings a bunch of sinners together, and that because of his grace and because of the cross, they can love, they can forgive, they can wrong each other and keep moving together with love and unity. And because unity, and not uniformity, but true unity and community is something that God brings about. And we need to get a big vision for what God wants to do in our lives, what God wants to do in our midst. And, uh, amen, I like that. Uh, in this last six months, we've watched... And many of y'all have participated on Wednesday night, sharing a meal together, sharing your life together, opening up your life for prayer and for encouragement and for correction. The worship team has been just building a great camaraderie and friendship. In fact, we had somebody come, and my, my father-in-law came, and, and he practiced with them on Thursday night and played on Sunday morning. And he walked away saying, man, I play in the band every week. But I've never been in a band that has such unity and such joy. And it's not, if you look at James and Michael, because they are just alike in every way. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find very much likeness in, in a lot of how the God's wired them and those things. But the love of Jesus unifies, builds, and co it's a cohesive thing. And so unity is so, and, and community is so cool. It's neat to see what God is doing. You know what, over the last six months, cars have been repaired. Homes have been repaired. We came with a need. $315, you guys gave 490 bucks to cover it. You guys have given the send. Eddie and Ashley help to offset some of the costs of the missions. There are so many people here that when they tell you, I will pray for you, they're not just giving you lip service. They're actually going to go, they're going to pray, and they're going to expect that God's going to hear them and is going to answer. That's cool, isn't it? That's what the community of believers, it's insane, but we know God. You know God. If you're a believer in Christ and you come to the gospel, you know God. He knows you, even more importantly. And he's going to listen to you, he's going to hear your prayers, and he's going to answer your prayers. And it may not always be in your time. It's rarely in my time. But the fact is, I can go to him and I can say, hey, it's insane, but I know you got it. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to expect that you're going to answer one way or another. And there's a, a lot of y'all who are just intensely prayerful in this community of believers. And um, on top of that, not only during the worship times on Sunday and community city groups on Wednesday, but I know that many people have been getting together outside of that, praying and going deeper, and praying for one another, and it's so cool. And I see God has just been forging that community, not because we're uh, in uniformity saying, hey, we all agree on all these things, but because there's unity, because we need Jesus, and we know that it's all about Him, and so it's been neat to see what God's doing over the next six months. We're really going to be intentional in continuing to expand that. Don's working on putting together some service projects so that we can serve together on some projects and really bless one another and others. We're also, like this Friday night, we're going to do a game time. We're going to start trying to do more just things that, that we can just do together and have fun, build friendship, build relationship, so that as we, and Eddie's going to bring this next section in a minute, as we continue to build those relationships, not just so that we can be, have fun and be comfortable, although we should be meeting one another's needs as we did in the early church, but so that we can be energized for the mission at hand. And that's what, in Philippians, he was saying, that we are together around this uh, idea of the gospel. And he says, um, <clears throat> that with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, we not only are collectively loving on one another, caring for one another, encouraging one another, admonishing one another, taking care of needs, but calling others to say, come with us to the kingdom. We know the king. We've already met him. By faith, we've met God. It sounds insane to you, but it's reality. Come with us to the kingdom. Let me introduce you to Jesus. He'd like for you to come with us. He'd like for you to repent and believe the gospel. So I'm going to turn it over to Eddie here and let him bring mission and renovation and I'll have some closing words here. <laughs> okay, um, I'm on the clock. <laughs> 20 minutes. Okay, I've got, uh, I'm a little long winded, so Troy made uh, abundantly clear that I need to uh, contain myself this morning. I'll do my best. But uh, we do got to leave room for the spirit, right? A little bit? Um, <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, I'm going to be sharing it on, on the, the other two parts of our mission. One being, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, our mission statement. Of course, uh, we, we just heard about community. I'm going to deal with mission as well as renovation, okay? So let's begin um, our discussion of the mission by uh, looking at Matthew 28. And I'm going to read a couple of verses. If you want to turn there with me, it's going to be Matthew 28. We're going to look at 18 through 20, all right? 18 through 20. All right, I'm going to... I'm going to carry on as you're turning there. 
Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Here it is. It's, this is called the Great Commission. This is what Jesus said shortly before his ascension. One of the last words that he shared with his disciples left buzzing in their ears as he was carried off. And he said this. Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So it's abundantly clear when you, when you look at the words of Christ here that um, is referred to as the, as, as the Great Commission, that the business of God is to showcase His glory in all the earth, and that happens one saved soul at a time. Remarkably, He has teamed up with ordinary people like you and me who have been rescued from the judgment of God to turn around and rescue others. From our knowledge and based on the survey feedback, we think that at least four people have come to know Christ as their Savior in the past six to 12 months here in this place. We praise God for that fruit. Now, let me ask you this. When I say the word missionary, what comes to mind? First thing, when I say the word missionary. If you're like many Christians, you likely think of a place called Africa and picture someone else. But we are striving to change your thinking so that when you hear the term missionary, you think of Northwest Houston and picture yourself. In order to cultivate this reality that we're all, each one of us, are missionaries of the kingdom, we continue to prevent, to present monthly challenges to this congregation. The challenges reflect, reflect one of two distinct evangelism approaches. The first one is relational. Basically, relational evangelism can be explained in this way. Someone who knows your name and you too know theirs. Every relationship starts at that point. The idea here is to purposefully overlap your life with another with the intent of sharing your faith or at least being willing to direct conversation towards spiritual things and see where God takes it. And secondly, the second approach to evangelism that we encourage you to consider is confrontational or aggressive. Now that kind of freaks some people out when they hear it, when they hear it uh, explained or defined in that way. So I like to call it just cut to the chase evangelism. How about we'll just, we'll just describe it that way here. Basically, it's defined in this way. When circumstances find you one-on-one -on -one with a previous unknown per person and you cut to the chase and share a quick and raw gospel presentation. And it's likely with someone that you'll probably never see again for the rest of your life. It could be a restaurant server. It could be someone who you sit next to on a plane. It could be, it could be a convenience store associate. You get the idea. Now, to cultivate rela a, a relational evangelism mindfulness among this body here, these are some challenges that we have put before you over the past six months. In April and May, we presented gift cards, you may recall, to Starbucks and Papa John's for you to pick up and use to provide a meal or refreshment for the purposes of invoking conversation towards spiritual things with someone that you already know. And in February, the challenge was to spend an evening with an unbeliever. To cultivate ag uh, aggressive evangelism, or if you will, cut to the chase evangelism mindfulness, we've encouraged you this month to give a track and a blessing to someone who may be sitting uh, at a restaurant that God lays in your heart, and you just want to pick up their tab, and then you want to present a track to them somehow as a result of them seeing the love of Christ demonstrated, and then how they too can come to, come to know Christ as well. Or maybe someone who's behind you in a convenience store line, you say, I want to pick up their Mountain Dew and Snickers bar. And you turn around and say, hey, I got you covered. I just want to give this to you. God loves you. Please read this. And in March, we asked, uh, we asked you to distribute some tracts that we made available to you to give to others as you shop and as you travel and as you just simply live life. Now, we do know that that when you evangelize, regardless of what type, 
typically it's pretty uncomfortable, and one type is downright terrifying. But I, I must tell you, as Troy just mentioned, that living on mission for God will never be comfortable, but always rewarding. Just out of curiosity, many, most of the people in here are children of God. So I'm curious, how many of you have come to know Christ as a result of relational evangelism? Let's see. Relational evangelism conversions in this body right here. Hold on. I want everyone to see your hands. There we go. Your parents count? Parents count. Of course, right? There we go. Boom. So we, we see the enormous power and fruit that comes from forming relationships and bringing those relationships to a point where you share your faith of a great God that they too may be reconciled and experience peace with God through what Christ has done for them on the cross. Please be willing to continue to cultivate those relationships and drive them to the point that you can share with them the only message that makes man right with God. Secondly, how many of you have, have been saved in this body through aggressive or cut to the chase evangelism? We've got Robert here. It, isn't that interesting? Robert is kind of the, the person who sets the pace in the area of aggressive evangelism. And it's because, interesting enough, that that's how God saved him. It, may, it, makes, it makes more sense, Robert, why you have such a passion for cut to the chase evangelism. And then, Ken. Awesome. You too have been saved through, um, through that. Well, praise God. And then the third type is proclamational evangelism, and that's simply inviting someone to church so that they hear uh, Troy teach or the Word of God proclaimed, and then the gospel shared. How many of you have been saved through that type of evangelism? Okay. Jennifer and a few here. Wonderful. There we go. So we see there's many ways that God uses frail people in order to share His message, and that's why you and me are called uh, ministers of reconciliation. As, as if we are appealing to others, be reconciled to God. What a privilege. Now, I want you to think back to the last time you shared your faith with another person. Generally speaking, at the risk of sounding legalistic, but I promise you that's not the intent. If it's been much longer than one month, it's likely that you've missed some opportunities and you've left some on the table. So, in obedience to Christ, as we see to fulfill the purposes of this church. We are going to continue to provide monthly challenges. However, we are going to, to, to take some different approaches than we've taken up um, in the past in order to reduce maybe some of the initial scare among some, but to still nudge you to speak up about our great God. Perhaps it's sharing your favorite verse with another. Perhaps it's sharing your testimony in story form. Or maybe you feel like you would crater by, 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 by sharing your story with someone verbally because you may get jumbled up and nervous. But you, but you can express yourself through email and you would like to write to another person. That too can be used in significant ways to remove some of the fear but yet get the message of Christ out there to those that you already know. In John 16, 7, listen to this verse. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. This is the words of Christ. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has already come. Two quick parting thoughts. Our mission is serious business, and God is using His servants who proclaim the gospel to bring about conviction of sin and a, and a knowledge of righteousness that comes by faith alone and Christ alone. And we are hoping for more sinners turned worshipers, salvation stories in the next six months. In the next six months, might you and me be the one to share with another how they can know the God of the universe. Robert, I'm going to ask you to pray for this church in the area of mission over the next six months that God would bear great fruit among us all. Please pray. Uh, dear Father, good morning, and I thank you for the privilege of prayer and first off, I want to thank you for all of the people that visited this morning, dear Father, and I pray that you will continue to bless them in their lives, dear Father, uh, in the name of Jesus. And dear Father, I pray that uh, you will uh, just 
light a fire under each one of us, uh, man, woman, and child, that comes and worships here, dear Father, to uh, have that uh, mindset of, of being on a mission of, of sharing either uh, the gospel verbally or through handing out a gospel tract, dear Father, wherever we go, or for praying for someone, asking if they need prayer, or for uh, sharing our testimony, dear Father, each one of those ways most effective, dear Father, for your kingdom. And I thank you for your revelation and revealing that to me and all of my brothers and sisters here. I pray that you would help all of us not to be cowards and not to fear man, but to fear you. And uh, I pray that you give us courage and boldness, dear Father, to go out and to uh, do whatever you call us to do each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Robert. The third the third critical part of our mission statement is renovation, that we experience renovated lives as a result of the power of the Holy Spirit working in, in us for the purposes of making us more and more like Christ. Listen to this verse out of 1 Peter 2. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. Becoming like Christ is the chief pursuit of of every believer, or at least it should be. Every New Testament book is written with this ultimate goal as the top priority of those who become children of God. It's Christ's ultimate plan for your life. Now, to bring about this renovation process among all those who belong to Him, Christ Himself knew exactly what was needed to reprogram hearts. Two of the most effective renovation tools in the hands of the Savior are this. Number one, regular worship participation in the local church. And secondly, a belief that God, the Holy Spirit, resides within you. A couple of quick thoughts within each category. Number one, Providence Church is an extension of Christ's instruction to make disciples of all nations. We commend the believers here in this place at Providence Church who have made an obvious commitment to attend this church regularly. This is a critical part of experiencing life renovation towards Christ. Now, we have been puzzled as to what to do about Sunday school or equipping hour. We feel it is a great opportunity for additional training and edification, but the response has been lukewarm. We did a 15-week key issues study earlier this year, and we just wrapped up a 10-week powerful passage study today. Moving forward, we will have short Sunday school studies scheduled sparingly, and we hope in time that more of the church family here will consider participating in equipping an hour, but we give thanks and praise to God that you are here and you continue to be here for our worship service, and we hope that you'll continue to make that a, a, a priority for every weekend that you plan for and secondly, a, crit a huge tool in the hands of our Savior to bring forth the renovation process is to believe that God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within you. In Acts chapter 5, Jesus, Jesus states, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. A reliance on God, the Holy Spirit, is a monumental aspect of this renovation process. Do you believe as a result of your born-again conversion, that God the Holy Spirit resides within you, lives inside of you. It's critical that you understand that and you tap into that extraordinary power that God makes available to conform you more and more to the image of Christ. I want to share with you in the words of many of the members of this church what God the Holy Spirit, how He has worked, to change and to renovate their lives. Listen to this. I have been encouraged in my own walk with God by seeing the faith and service of other believers in the church 
The encouragement that I get helps me resist temptations and endure trials that come every week. Jesus used Providence Church to show my family and I we should open our house to both believers and non-believers through faithfulness of a sister in Christ who allowed Providence Church to hold Sunday worship service at her home for at least one year before we were able, before we were able to worship at this building. I praise the Lord for people like her who Jesus used to show me and my family what it means to be hospitable. I also want to thank Jesus for all of the young men, including the pastor, for their love, involvement, and genuine care for both my my sons and my family were, um, were worshipers at a different church, and we were blessed to be a part. But I praise the Lord for the young men, for the young men of Providence, for their faithfulness and how the Lord has changed our lives as a result of the ministries here. Being at Providence has helped me realize that service and being, being God's hands in the church is a crucial part of fellowship. I definitely feel myself being cultivated for a heart of service. I thank Jesus for showing um, my family and I uh, the love, what it truly means to serve and love others. Since my family have been worshiping at Providence, the Lord has spoken to each of our, uh, my, uh, the members through the love and service of believers who attend Providence, Providence regularly. I give God all the credit, of course, for the comments I've made concerning Providence Church and not be accurate. If there wasn't people here who genuinely want to be obedient to God and live their lives to please and praise the Lord in all things. This is, a, this is a married couple. I feel we have unified in our mission more as a couple. We also are praying more often together. I've been challenged to share the gospel with, with, with strangers through my volunteering, which previously I had not done. I am praying with my wife more often, more patient with her, and more gentle with her. God has used the, uh, the believers at Providence to help encourage and guide me in my walk with Him. I have enjoyed and been impacted by the friendships I've made. I love the community at Providence. Troy does a good job of, uh, of helping remind us to keep Christ first and center in all that we do. The Lord has blessed us and through Providence in the following ways. Doctrine is not compromised. Doctrine has not been flowered or watered down. Friendships of like-minded believers and prayer support. A stronger desire to be in His presence and to live for His glory. And lastly, I am learning more and more about God our Father, Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit by listening and through application in my life. In short, renewing my mind in Christ. When I read... The feedback that many of you have shared as a result of how Christ is renovating your lives, this verse comes to mind. Now to him, who by the power that is working within us, is able to do far more than we can ever ask or think. To him, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. In the next six months, you will not see many changes as it relates to this area. You can be confident in knowing that God's word will continue to be preached zealously, and we will continue to promote community through Wednesday night gatherings and encourage you to hide God's word in your heart and pray in the spirit. We'd like to begin a Sunday prayer ministry called Meal, which essentially would be a place that people can come before service in the mornings with, with music playing um, to, to kind of cultivate an atmosphere of prayer, and they can spend some time before they come in here to worship, cleansing their heart and doing some business with God. We're hoping that God will stir up a person within our midst in order to lead a ministry like that. A couple of one noteworthy tweet. You may recall a couple of communions that I personally have led over the past six months that were accidentally second sermons in disguise. I think one Sunday I read 30 plus verses and I think I really impeded worship as a result of that. And I can assure you that won't happen again. Myself and all men that lead communion in this church will ensure that it's very response-based. Troy will have spent 20 to 30 hours praying and teaching us a message that God has placed on his heart, and the only appropriate response after teaching time is to respond to what God has taught us through his spirit as, as Troy, as the messenger, preaches his guts out. 
We will, we will make sure that there's more time to pray during communion and do business with God before we participate in the elements. So that's a wrap, my friends, on renovation by God's grace and through His Spirit. Might we all go deeper and commune with, with Him each and every day of our lives. Amen. appreciate Eddie's uh, diligence and hard work in this. You know what? Uh, we can't do anything, can we? You can't change your spouse. You can't change your kids. I can't change you. You can't change me. But we can't actually save anybody, can we? So everything, we're just kind of going, God, did you do? Would you work? Would you, you know, it's really about God. They can change. God did it. If anyone can save, God did it. It's really about Him. But that doesn't mean that we uh, don't need some encouragement. This, this last verse, James 5, 17 and 18, great encouragement. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. A lot of times we have to sing, those are the superheroes of the faith, right? Moses and Elijah and David. Me, I'm just a bomb. It's not true. Elijah was just like you and me. Same nature as us. Battle against sin. Battle to believe. Nothing different about him than us. You know what the only difference is? The difference is when you trust God. In our own strength, we can't do anything. But God is in the business right now of doing things. And he's invited us to participate. And so you and I, not having any strength of our own, can rely upon Christ and say, hey, but we can expect great things for, from God and attempt great things. We can expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. I want to encourage you. The real question is, will you trust God? Will you trust God? Obedience is a lot easier to trust, isn't it? Will you trust God? God is here. He's at work. He's everywhere present. You can't run and hide anywhere from God, according to Psalm 139. And if you're his kids, you're okay. So then the question is, will you believe him for great things? Will you watch? Will you pray? Will you attempt great things knowing that you and I have no ability? What we want to see is over this next six months, community, mission, and renovation, we want to see things that only God can do. Because you and I can fabricate a lot of stuff. We can do stuff and go, hey, I did that in my own flesh. But what good is that? We can put on a nice show, but we don't want to show. It, it has no value. You need to spend your time uselessly. What we want is Jesus to show up in real, tangible ways. And so if, the, if our story were written into the Bible, people wouldn't look at it and go, that's boring, I'll skip to the next story. But rather would say, wow, that's radical faith-based living. That's what you and I need. Radical faith-based living. And it's not something that superheroes of the faith could accomplish, and we can't. Elijah was a man with a nature just like you and I. So be encouraged. Father God, we just come this morning.